Good morning. Hello, my name is Mark Hughes. I'm a postdoc at the University of Florida. I work in Jason Smith's lab, and I'm going to be one of the moderators for today's session. Um, the session title is Shovel Ready Trees, Novel Strategies for the Development of Disease-Resistant Woody Plants. And one more thing, as you, um, if you have any questions, you have to walk over to the two microphones on, on the sides of the uh, room, and you can ask your questions from there. And I'm the second moderator. I'm Janita Hajabdijagiri, a research assistant professor at the University of Tennessee. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, please, no photography. So our first speaker today is Dr. Dana Nelson. He's a research geneticist and project leader of the USDA Forest Service Southern Research Station, um, also the Southern Institute of Forest Genetics, and he's also the co-director of the Forest Health Research and Education Center in Lexington, Kentucky. He has over 25 years experience in forest genetics and tree improvement, and today he's going to be talking about shovel-ready trees, forest health initiative, a model for the rapid development and deployment of disease-resistant trees. Okay, thank you, Mark, and thanks to Jason for putting the session together and the invitation and come to speak. I'll be representing several uh, co-PIs and cooperating scientists that were involved in the Forest Health Initiative Project. Uh, we were trying to develop a model to rapidly respond to emerging uh, or ongoing epidemics of uh, pest and pathogen in forest trees. So it was a large collaborative effort Uh, as we all know, forest trees are being threatened. There are several in the eastern United States that have been of interest uh, to uh, a number of, of folks in the forestry community in particular. I won't uh, go into any of those, but just to say we do have a forest health crisis, uh, primarily uh, due to invasive, uh, usually exotic pests. Uh, it's exasperated by ch the Chamet the uh, changing and generally warming climate and uh, the ever-present forest fragmentation that we're dealing with. So clearly new approaches uh, and tools are required to slow these declines and hopefully to reverse them and to recover forest health. The Forest Health Initiative um, was developed to test a particular hypothesis that a coordinated effort in biotechnology research uh, will lead to resistant trees capable of restoring a threatened species in a relevant time frame. Um, so we're really looking at uh, host resistance, resistant trees in short periods of time. Um, you know, what is it possible to utilize these new uh, approaches and, and technologies to do uh, such work? American chestnut uh, was chosen as a test case and in particular, we're looking at disease resistance uh, to the chestnut blight and Phytophthora root rot. And the relevant time frame, we were challenged to do something in three years uh, from basically our, our funders. Uh, chestnut blight is sort of the classic disease, uh, introduced disease on American chestnut, introduced in 1904, spread rapidly over the, the course of a few decades across the complete uh, range of American chestnut. Uh, killing essentially everything. Uh, over four billion trees were killed in, in less than 50 year period. Uh, the species basically persists uh, in the understory uh, throughout much of the range as uh, basal stump sprouts. So it went from one of the most dominant uh, or essentially the most dominant uh, hardwood species in the eastern U.S. forest to just persisting as an understory species as sprouts from stumps. Uh, so we were looking in this project to integrate uh, new emerging genomic and biotechnologies with the uh, existing materials and know-how. So work had been going on in chestnut genetics and breeding for decades, um, and, and so we wanted to sort of integrate new technology to see if we could really uh, speed up uh, the process of developing developing resistance uh, for restoration. Uh, 
And at the same time within this project, we were interested in engaging various stakeholders in social and environmental and regal, regulatory and legal issues around genetically modified forest trees as the, the notion was that in some of these um, invasive and exotic pests, uh, the resistance isn't available, it cannot be crossed into a species, so if we're going to do it, uh, genetic modification is a likely tool. Uh, certainly there's social and regulatory issues that had to be worked out. So this was uh, part of this particular project was to work the biological sciences side along with social and regulatory. We had funding from the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, and Duke Energy. Uh, on the social, environmental, regulatory, legal uh, side of the project, and also working with the biological team, uh, that group developed a, a roadmap to forest health. And so this is on the Forest Health Initiative website, but it sort of is a, uh, is a roadmap that takes one through the process of understanding and recognizing uh, pest or pathogen threat, analyzing what options are available to, in, to develop host resistance uh, to combat that threat. And that analysis is done with technological, ecological, and sort of social framework. Um, if, um, and that's sort of shown in the middle of this road map, and then if, if the uh, best uh, solution or only only solution is to move into uh, genetic modification then you slip, you move down into the green box and of course there's several components uh, on the regulatory and social side uh, to to work through along with the biological technological sides to come up in the end with possibly something that can be used for restoration uh, and then with a continual monitoring process that may be in place. Uh, you may get down into that green box and determine that for one reason or another it, it's going to be a no-go and then of course you cycle back to look for uh, al alternative solutions or decide to do nothing. So that's about all I'll say on the uh, oops, uh, social and environmental and regulatory. So there was a, a, a good piece of work going on there and some of that is still continuing. Uh, beyond the initial sort of three-year project. I'll be, the rest of my talk will be focused on the biological sciences research. Uh, there we had a highly integrated, a so-called braided uh, group working in three main areas. Uh, we had people working with the germplasm, the breeding projects, and uh, genetic mapping, QTL mapping. Uh, we had a genome sequencing and candidate gene discovery effort. And then we had a clonal propagation, gene transformation, and early screening effort. And again, so three different efforts all going on uh, in a fairly integrated uh, fashion so that information was continually exchanged, uh, all focused on developing uh, a plantable tree um, in a relevant time frame. And again, in this particular case, we were uh, working with three years. Uh, so I'll say a few things on each of those sections of biological research. Uh, we were working with material that the American Chestnut Foundation's breeding program had developed over 20 plus years. Uh, they were utilizing a back cross breeding program depicted here, basically uh, integrating resistance in blight, uh, chestnut blight, fungal uh, disease, uh, to uh, American chestnut through back, back crossing. And so Charles Burnham had developed uh, this particular scheme uh, taken uh, basically straight from classical uh, plant breeding uh, methodologies and um, published that in 86 and this has been followed uh, uh, by the American Chestnut Foundation. So we had access to essentially segregating populations in back cross generations of material for the, for the genetic mapping component of our work through the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, we also, they also had uh, developed, um, them and other collaborators had spent quite a work developing uh, good phenotypic screens for the two major diseases, Phytophthora root rot and chestnut blight, uh, so very important. And that led to uh, mapping uh, QTLs for uh, resistance to the two 
pathogens. And so this picture just depicts the reference genetic map of Chinese chestnut, the resistant parent, uh, resistant species, and in this um, case we utilized a few different parents. Uh, it shows locations of, of actual three CBR genes or CBR loci, so these are regions that showed um, significant resistance to chestnut blight. And then it, it shows one, the red uh, locus is a, the first uh, Phytophthora root rot uh, QTL locus that was mapped. Uh, since then we've mapped two additional QTLs for uh, root rot resistance. Uh, so that's sort of how they're laid out on the genome. Uh, we had uh, dish, uh, recently we've, we've worked with TACF to come up with larger populations for mapping Phytophthora root rot resistance. The two boxed ones are two populations we're working with now. They have over two or three hundred individuals come from two different sources of, of Chinese chestnut. Uh, so we expect potential different QTLs. Uh, again, uh, very nicely developed uh, phyto uh, uh, phyto uh, phenotypic system for screening for Phytophthora root rot resistance as shown here. Um, this particular work, uh, we were utilizing genotyping by sequencing markers, which was really made possible or facilitated uh, by having a reference genome sequence, which the genome sequencing part of the project was working on, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in just a minute. So having a reference sequence really helped uh, developing GBS markers. So here's just some data on a particular cross with GBS markers. And then combining that with these larger, with a larger population of over 200 individuals, uh, again, good phenotypic data. We've landed on uh, now th on the left-hand side, the A panel, uh, three very strong QTLs for Phytophthora root rot resistance, uh, segregating from the hybrid parent. So this is mapped in a Backcross one generation family. Um, so three loci uh, segregating from the hybrid parent, and then a fourth lo uh, fourth locus that's linked to the uh, one of, one of the lo loci from the hybrid parent uh, actually segregates um, so a resistance segregating. Uh, provided by the American or the recurrent parent. So we have evidence for QTLs in the, for disease resistance in chestnut, uh, both for blight and for root rot. Uh, for the blight, uh, we get some of the same QTLs in, in some crosses, but not all crosses. So there is uh, some differences between crosses. Uh, we don't have, en uh, don't have enough information on the Phytophthora to, to say that. Uh, at this stage, but some, and also some blight QTLs appear to be stronger when, when phenotyped with one particular strain of chestnut blight versus another. So there is uh, some potential for interaction there, but it's, it's, not, it's not strong, but there are some differences. So moving on to genome sequencing and uh, candidate gene discovery. Uh, we do have an assembly of the genome. The right-hand column shows the most recent one. It was re released last year. Uh, the nice part about this is it's uh, mapped onto the physical map. So we had integrated physical genetic maps uh, made earlier, and uh, we've been able to uh, put the, um, um, the genomic sequence on, onto that. Uh, so again, we have genetic, physical, and genome sequence, and, and having these integrated maps has been very useful. Uh, the, particular QTLs for blight were sequenced using back clones or the physical clones that span the QTL region. So we have really good deep um, sequence information and good assemblies through uh, three of the blight QTLs. All of this is in the Chestnut Genome Browser uh, that Meg Statton uh, from the University of Tennessee now, uh, she was at Clemson, has developed on the Hardwood Genomics website. Uh, we use the information to come up with candidate genes for, for blight resistance in this case, and those, of course, we wanted to feed to the genetic transformation pathway that was the third component of the team. Uh, we do have uh, very nice somatic embryogenesis protocols um, developed by Merkel's lab at Georgia and Powell and Maynard's lab at, at uh, uh, State University of New York in Syracuse. <laughs> 
working well with the Backcross material. These are being uh, utilized now in field tests just to screen uh, for resistance in the field. Um, we have a couple that we have a plan for utilizing combining somatic embryogenesis with backcross breeding. Uh, so you sort of go through the embryogenesis process to develop, to identify and field test specific genotypes. And then those can be taken out of cryo storage and then generated for use as parents in, in the breeding program. So you have phenotypically selected based on replicated copies of plants uh, to improve your accuracy for selection. Uh, we do have a nice transgenic um, genetic information pipeline. Uh, we're screening also for, uh, with genetic engineering uh, for phytophthora resistance. Again, um, we're using a, the, the phytophthora phenotyping screen. Uh, we spent some work developing earlier, more rapid screening procedures. Uh, the fastest one can be completed on a few uh, leaves of a relative, of quite of a one, less than one year old tree by inoculating the midrib. And uh, we do get um, a nice response uh, with one particular gene. Uh, several genes are in the pipeline being tested. This is an early gene uh, that actually did not come from a Chinese chestnut. It was a, a wheat gene, the oxalate oxidase gene, that uh, shows a very nice resistant reaction uh, on the right versus with, with the trans gene versus the left, which is highly susceptible without. And so we're interested in utilizing genetic modified trees in, at, in crossing those into the breeding material for diversity. So with that, I'll just say that we have shovel-ready tree, uh, which is what we called our plantable tree. And this one was, was a transgenic tree planted in uh, New York City um, a couple years back. So close with that. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Let's see, let me go back. Okay, our next speaker will be um, Dr. John Davis. He's an associate uh, director of the Florida Agricultural Experiment Station at the University of Florida. And, um, but he won't be here today. So actually, uh, Kathy, Doc Kathy Smith will be replacing um, John Davis for this talk. She's a biological scientist with the USDA Forest Service, working at the School of Forest Resources and Conservation at the University of Florida. And thank you, Kathy. Good morning. Uh, a little clicker thing. Mm, okay. So, um, good morning. Uh, so, um, I'm not John Davis, but I know John Davis. <laughs> and I've worked with him for many years, and um, I've worked on these projects that I'm going to talk about, many of them. So, I'm not completely unqualified. <laughs> so, uh, let's get started. Uh, the first slide was a, a big slide of acknowledgments of people. Um, breeding of southern pines has been going on for over 50 years, and with genomics and then starting maybe in the 90s and then the genome sequencing era and everything, many, many different kinds of scientists have been added into the researchers that work on, on um, views of form rust particularly, and, mo and on the, both on the pine and the pathogen side. And so it, it's quite a long list. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, it's a lot of collaboration between universities and the Forest Service, who have been working in pines for many, many years, and um, also uh, tree cooperatives, timber companies that get together and contribute money to research. Uh, first, for the first disease I want to talk about is pitch canker. Uh, pitch canker occurs in southern pines. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, it creates a long le a lesion of necrotic uh, tissue. It, it has purpling color. 
Uh, it, the, the microscopic slide is uh, showing the xylem being clogged by mycelial growth and the resin that is exuded um, from, the, from the wound site. Um, this slide shows there's genetic resistance in, in pines, loblolly pine in this case, for, for, um, for pitch canker. The top uh, panel shows uh, lesion length versus uh, the number of clones with that lesion length. And the lines, each, each number above the lines is a clone. And the line is the, the uh, different lesion lengths that occurred for that, that uh, clone. Uh, among the replicates, and you can see that they don't overlap. If it has a large lesion length, it, it, it's on the, you know, it doesn't overlap with those with the smaller lesion lengths. So that kind of says that their that they're different clones are resistant and susceptible. And on the bottom, uh, what that is is a correlation between different uh, different inoculation techniques. So the Resistance Screening Center, which is in Nashville, North Carolina, does a, a screening of clonal and families for pitch canker, uh, canker, and what they do is they tip inoculate. They, I think they crop the top and then they spray in a sprayer. And at UF, we compared that to just hand inoculation by wound, and it had good correlation. Uh, it's important to have a good, good assay when you're doing genetics. And Pitch canker is a worldwide disease. It's in many, many species, and it's important in radiata. Uh, it's episodic, so by nature it comes and it goes. It comes, they'll have an episode of it for a couple of years, and then it'll kind of pass. And uh, it, the, other, the other interesting thing is that people are interested in whether or not the uh, outbreaks of, of, uh, of pitch canker will increase with climate change and um, increased temperatures and rainfall. And in fact, at the University of Florida, Jason Smith and Tanya Quesada have started a project to work on that, on whether or not that, that will happen and how to maybe predict it. And um, so people are working on that. And um, the, so the gen genetic resistance appears to be minor genes, so many genes with small effects. And uh, the, f so on the left is the, um, you know, uh, in the greenhouse inoculations, and those, uh, those results correlate well, both on the clonal and the family level with the field, which is on the right. So uh, this slide is a comparison between uh, the pitch canker and fusiform rust, the next disease that I was gonna talk about. Uh, the lesion, the gall length versus lesion length, there's no correlation, which is really important for breeders that, that they know that they cannot, they have to breed for these two diseases separately and the, this trait and uh, that they're not the same, caused by the same gene, genes. Uh, the next disease is fusiform rust. Uh, it's a biotrophic fungus that um, keeps its host alive with a, and it's a regional threat in the southern U.S., the loblolly and slash pine uh, 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 range, and it's incited by uh, Cronarchum quercum, a, a fungus that was recently, um, 2012, the, ge the genome was sequenced, and we were involved in that project. Uh, genetic resistance is major gene, so it's gene for gene, major gene resistance, typical of Russ. The, um, the, in the things that I wanted to point out about this life cycle are that the on the, um, it has an acial host and a telial host. The telial host is the oak and the acial is the pine. Uh, the pine is the more heavily studied one since that's the, a crop species that people obviously care about in our breeding. And um, the pycneospores are, are, are haploid, which, get, which is uh, something that gets, can be used in genetic studies, and we will all show that later on. And the other thing that I wanted to say that other rusts that are uh, a problem like wheat rust and poplar rust and things like that, they're occurring on the um, repeating telial stage of the, in those um, diseases. And this is occurring on the um, acial host, which is, is different. 
Uh, this slide is just sort of showing the, the, the idea that uh, 50 years of pine breeding has made a big difference for fusiform rust. I guess the black dots are to represent dead trees in a plot and the white are alive. And, and so the top ones are more from like the, the 60s or in the 70s. And now you're the, after many, many years of breeding, just breeding resi resistance, there's, high, there's a lot of resistance out in the field to um, fusiform rust. Um, the problem with rust is the galls cause stem breakage and in wind and rain and hurricanes. Uh, so this slide is depicting the, um, the assay that's used to screen for resistance for um, fusiform rust. Um, at the resistance center, uh, they, 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 they perform this procedure. Uh, they go out across the United States, the ra that's the range of loblolly and slash pines, and they, collect, they do collections every year of ACO spores, and they bring them back and they store them so they have a collection, which is nice. And they um, they have to go ahead and grow up the oaks and the, the and grow the telial spores and get get the the basidial spores that in fact that infect the, that they infect the pines with. So they have a whole procedure for that. It's and it works very well. And they've used it to screen families for timber companies and for researchers as well as um, researchers that are looking for the genetic, to the major, major resistance genes. And it's now known that there's nine major resistance genes, at least nine known, in pine, in the uh, lovely. So this is a progression of the uh, marker integration over years and how that relates to the markers around the first um, resistance gene that was discovered, FR1. Uh, it's, it's on a map location on linkage group two, and uh, that was known when in 2014, the Dave's Neal, Dave Neal's group did a, the genome sequence for loblolly pine, and we looked for it, they looked for it in their scaffold, the, uh, the, the markers, and they sent us a list of markers, and we compared that to the data that we had for things that are associated with um, FR1. Uh, and, and one of them came up very strong, and it was, it, it, the interesting thing was that it came from an EST that had a, that um, had a NBS and an LLR, and the sequencing that Neil's group did to support their genome sequence included this tier, so then it suddenly became a tier NBS LLR, so a genuine FR1 candidate, but we're, Cautious to call it that because there's a uh, there's a five to ten centimorgan um, wobble in that, so it's not it's not um, it needs to be fine mapped more with more individuals, and we're working on that. And also, it occurs on um, the end of linkage group two with many uh, several other resistance genes. So there's a cluster there, like resistance genes that tend tend to occur in. So that's what's going on on that. And we're currently working on trying to fine map that and resolve that area better. Uh, now I, this, I'm turning over to the fungal side and the fungal mapping, because we've also been doing fungal work. And there's a, there's a in the 90s, the, few, the um, Tom Kumachek and the Forest Service did a um, genetic map of fusiform rust. And they also, they mapped uh, markers around the AVR1 gene, the, the um, avirulence gene that corresponds to FR1. And um, the way that they did that was that the, in pine, they can, they can um, filter the, um, they, when, there's a, when there's a genetic interaction with the, with the major, the avirulence gene and the, and the major resistance gene, there's no, no gall, but at all other times, they'll get a gall. And, and the end result is the picnia that come out are either on the, on the if, it's a, if it's a resistant tree, they're all virulent. And if it's a, if it's a susceptible tree, it's 50-50 virulent, avirulent. And that's something that can be utilized uh, in research, in the genetic research. Uh, also, what we, what we did when the genetic, we got a genomic sequence for fusiform rust is we looked for the markers that are surrounding 
um, AVR1, and we found them in the genomic sequence on scaffold 20 in the, in the, in the JGI sequence. And so it was narrowed down to an interval, and that was confirmed by an FST analysis that was um, sequencing of uh, pycnia drops from those trees that I was talking about above. They sequenced pools of them and then looked for deviation from one-to-one -one segregation, and lo and behold, that arrow is pointing to scaffold 20, the same, tw the same scaffold that is the, that the markers are present on. So it was like in another confirmation that that was the mark, right, right marker. And that being said, we currently, we're working hard on it, but we have an interval and AVR genes are different from resistance genes and they don't, they don't have a known um, protein structure. So it's kind of hard to predict out of many genes which gene would exactly be the right one. So we need to narrow that down more and we're working on that. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, take home messages for breeding, um, you have to understand the heritability and genetic architecture of the individual gene, the two, two examples, fusiform rust and, um, and pitch canker, they're very different, gene for gene, not gene for gene. Um, artificial inoculation methods are useful and not only useful but important and essential in um, mapping. Uh, markers guide breeding, selection, and deployment, and I'd l I would add that the more perfect your markers are, the, the better off you are. <laughs> and I didn't, oops, sorry. That's it. Okay. Are there any questions? So, are there any questions? Okay, well, thank you, Kathy. So our next presenter is Dr. Jared Leboldis. He earned his PhD with Peter Blenis for Forest Biology and Management at the University of Alberta. And he spent four years as an assistant professor at North Dakota State University in plant pathology. Currently, he's an assistant professor in botany and plant pathology at Oregon, Oregon State University. His presentation is titled Confronting Emerging Pathogens, a Genomics-Powered Approach to Protecting Forest Health. So I'd like to thank, begin by thanking the, uh, uh, Jason and the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today. And uh, um, I'm excited to talk about at least a portion of the research that we're, that we're doing at, uh, we did at NDSU and that we're continuing on at, at OSU to look at uh, resistance and susceptibility in poplar. And I think uh, I was at the plenary talks this morning and one of the speakers made a comment that, that all diseases are now uh, worldwide. And I thought that was kind of a frightening statement, but I also think it kind of puts this approach in context. And I'm hoping uh, through presenting four lines of evidence that I can convince you that this is a, this is a potential approach for trying to manage new diseases and, and uh, older diseases in natural ecosystems. So the case study that I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, uh, septoria canker, so anyone who works in poplar and hybrid poplar knows that in the eastern United States this is the major limiting factor, one of the major limiting factors in plantation forestry of hybrid poplar. Uh, it's caused by a fungal pathogen, uh, the name's changing along with everyone else's uh, favorite pathogens, but was septoria massiva, is now spherulina massiva. Uh, you might also have seen it referred to as microsphera populorum. Causes two specific symptoms. A uh, leaf spot disease, which was first described by Peck in New York State in 1884. And then uh, my favorite symptom, uh, the, it also causes a stem canker disease. And that, this is uh, caused on, on uh, non-co-evolved hosts, so any hybrid poplars or poplar trees planted from other regions uh, get this canker. Um, and as you can see, a uh, single infection can result in stem breakage, and that's really why uh, people care about it from a biomass perspective. And that's going to be the focus of this talk. So just to give you an idea of the potential impact of uh, the canker, here's some, uh, some data from several studies that have, 
been ongoing since the 1980s. So in Michigan, five years after planting, 86% of trees had septoria cankers, and two years later, 69% had broken tops. I think if you see that kind of data, you know that this is a serious problem. Uh, north central US, so this is from, uh, I think from, from where Jason did his, uh, his PhD work in Minnesota. Uh, there's a, uh, an area where they planted 10,000 hectares of a uh, susceptible genotype, and greater than 90% of those trees became infected, and 74% of them were dead after a certain period of time. Uh, there's a study we did in northern Alberta during part of my graduate work where we see the same kind of pattern. And then perhaps relating to uh, this emerging disease issue is recently uh, septoria canker has been reported uh, west of the Rocky Mountains, an area where it hadn't been seen before. Um, and there's been some work done by a group out of UBC where they've demonstrated that uh, it was probably the movement of, of uh, plant material that introduced it into this area. Uh, and we're not sure where this is going to go, uh, but it sort of, you know, brings, uh, brings the, the importance of this to the forefront. Um, and so when you look at most of these papers, it's basically a consensus that disease resistance is the best way to manage this disease. Uh, it's the only economically viable way. And given that most of these trees uh, uh, are in a forest, a forest setting, probably the only ecologically acceptable way to manage the disease. Unfortunately, there's only a single study that's ever that's been done that looks at the genetics of resistance. This was done by Newcomb and Ostry, uh, published in Phytopathology, and there were two conclusions they came up with from this, uh, from this work. One was that resistance appeared to be recessive, and the second uh, was that we need, someone needs to develop a better way to do screening to improve phenotyping in the greenhouse. And so as part of my PhD work, we, did the, the, we developed an inoculation assay. Uh, and then from there, I had a master's student who uh, demonstrated that this assay not only uh, separates resistant susceptible individuals in the greenhouse, but it's predictive of long-term field performance. So those are two really important things. <clears throat> and then we were kind of there, we're, you know, it was two, 2014 and we had finished this work and I kind of thought about where are we going to go from there. And I happened to be at a plant and animal genome meeting and I heard Jerry Tuscan give a talk. And he was talking about this association mapping population for Populus trichocarpa. Uh, and I don't know any of you are familiar with this, but this is an impressive resource that uh, without this, we probably wouldn't have been able to make any of the progress that we've made to date. But what they did was from the, from the species range of Populus trichocarpa, they took 1,000 individuals, they resequenced all of them to a depth of 15x, and they developed markers. So the total marker data set is 48 million SNPs and indels, and then to do the genome-wide association mapping, which I'm going to talk about today, we use about 8.2 million of those features. So that resource is really quite impressive, and without that, we wouldn't be able to get to where we are. And then they also uh, facilitate this by having the computational ability to handle this, this type of a data, data set. So I've got a couple people on here who uh, uh, are basically des deserve all the kudos for this work because they're the ones who phenotyped over 4,000 trees in the greenhouse. Um, so we took 800 of those genotypes we talked about and we used our inoculation assay and we measured a whole bunch of different phenotypes and did association mapping and it turned out just a simple count of lesions per centimeter on the stem uh, was, uh, gave the strongest associations. And when we ana analyzed the data, uh, we found 82 genes that were significantly associated with septoria canker resistance or susceptibility. And when we look at the top four candidates, uh, that's when we started to get really excited. Because initially I didn't think this was going to work as well as it did. But we see the top two on there are, are called RLPs or, or uh, receptor-like proteins. Um, and then you have uh, two, two at the bottom. One's a susceptibility factor and the other's a resistance gene. But the thing that was really exciting is when you start looking through the literature, what you see is that these RLPs and RLKs have been shown to function together to confer resistance. So a really good example of that is with Cladosporium fulvum, uh, where you see that kind of, where you see that kind of relationship. And so we have these three resistance genes pointer here somewhere. So if we three resistance genes, RLP1, RLP2, and this 
RLK, and basically we think they function together in a complex to perceive the pathogen and transmit a signal to the nucleus uh, initiating a defense response. And then we have, which I don't have too much time to talk about today, this G-type LEC RLK, which is a different type of gene which we think is involved with susceptibility and actually suppresses the defense response. So that's all well and good. We have marker data uh, and, and correlations that suggest we found something that might be the genes involved. And so what, the next step we wanted to do was to look at uh, expression data for those genes following inoculation. And so we selected resistant and susceptible genotypes that we knew had our candidate genes in them. And we did inoculations and we uh, uh, extracted RNA and looked at uh, expression across three time points, so 0, 24, and 72 hours. And it was really exciting because the expression basically mimicked or acted as we thought it was going to. Uh, with what we were predicting, how those genes would function. So the resistance genes, these three here, all peaked in expression at, uh, at 24 hours post-inoculation. And then the uh, susceptibility gene actually uh, in the susceptible genotype uh, was constitutively expressed, so expressed at high levels through across all the time points. Um, then, this, then I want to highlight the, the, the third line of evidence, which is basically, uh, and the power of having a resequenced natural population, is we can go into all the individuals in that population and predict gene function. Um, and granted, these are predictions, but it sort of gives us clues as to, as to what might be going on. So here we have uh, the, th the RLP gene, so these are receptors that are out in the apoplast sensing the pathogen. And what we see are a large number, represented by the red arrows, uh, loss of function mutations. And so these are high impact loss of function, they're frame shifts, they're premature stops. So they're things that are likely to not, uh, or they're, they're, things, they're, they're mutations that are likely to cause the gene product to, to be non-functional. And it turns out that when we correlate those, um, loss of function mutations with the phenotypes that we see in the greenhouse, we basically see a perfect correlation. So, so, so trees that have the resistant candidate genes are resistant, and so they look like that. And trees which have the loss of function mutations in, in, their, in, the, in the sequence of any one of those three, uh, it turns out to be susceptible. Now the thing that, that that I'm probably the most excited about when we look at this is the, the, which is in black and it's really hard to see there, but I've got the fourth gene listed underneath and we actually see the opposite, the opposite pattern. So when that gene uh, is functional, not only does it confer susceptibility, but it also suppresses uh, the, the action of those, of, those, of those three resistance genes. So it, um, and so we, we think that that, that that is a likely explanation. So if I go back to when I was mentioning that study by Austrian Newcomb, that resistance is, is recessive, we think this might be explaining that recessive, the, the recessive nature of resistance in this, in this population. So there are a couple caveats to how well this works. And I, I, I do want to highlight these because I think it's easy to get caught up in how exciting and how, and how well this worked is that the genomic resource was already in place when we started. Without that resource, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did. Um, the other thing I think that's important, and other people are going to talk about this as we go through the session today, is that there's other approaches to tackling these problems as well. And it's probably a combination of this geno of a genomics approach with some of the other approaches uh, with development of uh, resistant germplasm that are, uh, that will be used in combination and be the most effective. Uh, and then the final uh, thing I wanted to mention was this is a pathogen that has a relatively narrow host range. It affects poplar, it affects all sorts of species of poplar, uh, but the host range is relatively narrow compared to something like Phytophthora remorum uh, or laurel wilt that I think we're going to talk about later on. Uh, and those types of diseases present a whole other set of challenges, I think. And, uh, and so I, I think it's an exciting time to be involved in this. 
Uh, and, I, you know, I hope I've convinced you that this type of approach is, a, is, is one way that we can try and, and manage these types of emerging or invasive diseases. And, of course, I'd like to conclude by thanking my lab group who pretty much did all the work and the folks at the DOE who were uh, very supportive and sent me all the population to work with and then finally funding sources. So thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Thanks for your talk, Jared. Uh, have you been able to take your markers from the association panel and start to screen some of the uh, parental breeding material from Greenwood to see if they have those resistance genes or not? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. We have not done anything with the Greenwood um, uh, material, but what we have been doing is, is targeted resequencing of, uh, of a poplar uh, mapping population, so the hybrid one with Populus deltoides and Populus trichocarpa. And from our preliminary results, we're basically seeing that uh, deltoides, which is resistant, has those RLPs, and um, the hybrids, when depending on the, the recombination, they either don't or do. So what we're seeing in that population is supporting our hypothesis. that confers susceptibility. Do you see any signatures for horizontal gene transfer into the genome? And what potentially are the other functions of it? Like, why would it be there? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Why is it there? Why is there something there that's conferring susceptibility? Um, so that's a, I guess the way to think about it is that they're not co-evolved, right? Septoria musiva and Populus trichocarpa, have, it's a recent introduction, and presumably that gene's involved in some other function. Those, so when we look in the literature, that category or family of genes is typically involved in symbiosis. Um, so there's some evidence that those G-type LEC RLKs are involved in rhizobial associations. And in those situations, you get suppression of innate immunity, uh, which is the kind of pattern that, that we're seeing here. And I didn't get a chance to present it, uh, but we have uh, a bunch of marker genes, so things that would typically be upregulated in, in resistance responses, so like workies, uh, NPR1, kind of hallmarks or defense responses, those are all suppressed by the presence of that, that gene as well. So um, that's kind of the way we're, we're going. Thank you, Dr. Labaldus. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Katarina Villari. She earned her PhD in crop science and plant protection at the University of Padua in Italy. And then she did a postdoc at The Ohio State University with uh, Dr. Enrico Bonello. Her main interests are the interactions amongst trees, fungal pathogens, insect herbivores, and um, their aspects of chemical ecology. Uh, the title of her presentation is Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy for the Rapid Identification of Disease-Resistant Trees. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction, and thanks, Jason, for inviting me to this talk. So, um, one of the consequences of the increased uh, international trade is the increasing of introduction of uh, pests and pathogens um, for uh, forest trees. And we know from experience that most of the strategies used to keep those invaders at bay as trying even from the beginning to prevent the introduction of those pests and pathogens or uh, biological control or eradication attempts are not always um, successful. So we have to find an alternative way to protect our plants. And among the alternative way, genetic resistance is one of the most valuable options. Because even though most of the plants lacking any coevolutionary history with their uh, invaders will lack the possibility to resist, because of genetic variability, there's going to be there some individuals that are actually able to resist. So it would be extremely important to be able to fast track down those plants, identify them, and then breed them and use them to preserve the forest germplasm. 
However, uh, selecting through the normal classic breeding screening in the greenhouse can take forever, especially if we're talking about woody plants, because once you have the seed, the pollen, you get the seedlings, you still have to test them, and you have to test them several years because one round of testing is never enough. And with woody plants, it's easy to get 10 years in a nothing. It could be really quick. Uh, it could be really slow. So there is urgent need for rapid wave of identifying resistant trees. And we know from uh, Jared talk as well and uh, that genetic markers are definitely a uh, valuable and important possibility. But with this talk, I'll try to convince you that there are other ways as well, and in particular, the use of chemistry. And I know chemistry is a bad beast, but it can be really useful, especially if it's used together with uh, other techniques as uh, genetic markers. So uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And I have to say it took me one year just to learn how to pronunciate this thing. So luckily we can use FTIR, which is much more uh, user friendly, especially for me. So FTIR uh, take advantage of the fact that different chemical bonds, so um, chemical functional group basically, react when exposed to infrared light in a different way. And at the end of the story, the result of a FTIR run, it's a chromatogram. But while it's basically impossible from this chromatogram to know what compounds are in this mixture that we are analyzing, it has a region that it's a fingerprint region because it's particularly rich of information. So as a fingerprint, it gives us no information of what's inside, but is uniquely associated with that type of mixture. And it can be used to build uh, uh, statistical models. And in particular, for FTIR, the models that we use are SIMCA, Soft Independent Model by Class Analogy which is used to model and predict qualitative traits, so uh, the phenotype, resistant or susceptible. And partial least square regression, which is used to uh, model and predict quantitative traits, so the lesion length, for instance, or the percentage of symptoms, or the amount of a specific compound that we know that is associated with resistance. So all my work with FTIR start uh, thanks to Anna Conrad, which uh, it's here in the right in the picture. We were in Utah climbing mountain, but it's also on the back of the room. So for any further question, you can ask her as well. So she was able to successfully use FTIR for the identification of resistant or susceptible coast live oak to fight after a morum, the causal agent of sudden oak death. And she also wrote this interesting review on the potential application of infrared and Raman spectroscopy for the identification of uh, disease-resistant trees. However, at that time, she only worked with one path system. So it did work very well, but she might have been really, really lucky. So before uh, we can say that FTR can be broadly used in different path systems, we have to test it and more. And that was my work. So my aim was to determine if this technique that was working well in one system could be applied in other path systems as well. And I chose to work with Connie first because she worked with Oak, so I wanted to be as far as possible from her work in order to have a, a broader range of potential application. And in particular, I chose to work with a, a Pordorphocida and Phytophthora lateralis, which is a causal agent of Pordorphocida root rot, and white bark pine and Cronertum ribicola, the causal agent of white, bark, uh, white pine blister rust. And I chose those two path systems because those are among the two well, uh, the, among the most well characterized path systems in terms of phenotype lines, so resistant and susceptible lines. And this because Richard Sniasko at the Torino Genetic Resource Center uh, in Oregon, USDA Forest Service, uh, worked with those two systems for years, testing and testing again the progenies of plants in order to assess the phenotype. So he had a well characterized system in which parent trees were phenotyped by testing the progenies for years and years again. But our hypothesis is that we can predict the phenotype or other uh, uh, traits associated with resistance directly by testing the parent trees without, without having to go through the progenies. And we will be able to do this because we're gonna build our models on well-characterized trees. So we still need somebody, uh, some uh, plants which progeny has been tested, but once we build our models on those plants, we will be able to go in the field and sample directly the parent trees and know if those trees or their progeny is gonna be resistant or susceptible. So let's come to the methods. For the Porter procedure, I sampled my plants directly at the Dorina Genetic Resource Center in Oregon. I was not able to access those parent trees directly, but I sampled rooted cuttings of those parent trees, so genetically identical material. 
And I sample both roots because it's, uh, oops, it's where the symptoms develops and twigs, just because they're very easy to sample. So if twigs were a good predictor in the future, we don't have to go there and dig out the roots, which uh, I'll tell you, it's a lot of work. So we want to have a quicker method uh, to screen our plants. While for the um, white bark pine, I sample my plants at the Crater Lake National Park. And in this case, I was able to access directly those parent trees whose progeny has been tested by Richard for years and years. And I sample both the um, current year needles, previous year needles, and also the remaining naked shoot. Again, because I wanted to know which of those tissue was the best predictor to phenotype the plants. So I collect all the samples, uh, brought it back to Columbus, extract phenolics, and run it on a benchtop instrument. And I use Simca to discriminate the phenotype and partial least squared regression to predict qualitative traits, and in particular, uh, mortality rates in the progenies of Porter cedar and severity of the symptoms in the progenies of Whiteberg pine. So what were the results? First of all, for uh, Porter cedar, we saw that twigs were indeed a better predictor than roots. So for any future application, we don't have to go there and dig out the roots. And that's a pretty good result for me, especially in terms of time of work. So Porter cedar has three different uh, Phenotype. It has a major resistant gene, so uh, qualitative resistance, a partial resistant, and susceptible trees. And whatever was the combination of two traits that we were looking at, the Senka model was always able to correctly classify the phenotype. So how do we read those results? Those are Kuhlmann's plot. Kuhlmann's plot is one of the output of the Senka model. It, its Kuhlmann plot is divided in four quadrants. So in this quadrant goes plants that the model is not able to classify. And, and you can see it's always empty, so our model was always able to classify the plants. In those two quadrants goes plants that the model uniquely assigned to either one or the other phenotype. In this case, uh, resistant and susceptible. Well, vice versa, resistant and susceptible. And this quadrant over here goes plants that belongs to both the classes. So Simca build uh, classes in order to be uh, overlapping, and that's typical of the model, the S of Sinca stands for soft, and soft means exactly this, class can be overlapping, and it's really good in a natural system. There's always going to be some intermediate uh, phenotypes. But even though they're overlapping, the model will still assign an identity, a phenotype, to those plants, depending on how close they are to uh, one of the other uh, quadrants. However, we still have, uh, whatever was the combination, we have a nice uh, classification. And when we get to the partial least squared regression, uh, here we're looking at the correlation plot. So it's a correlation between what is the measure mortality rates and the predicted one. And we can see that there's a very nice correlation. So the model was able to correctly uh, predict the mortality rates of the progenies of the plants that I was testing. And this was obtained with only three factors, which is a really good number. So the lesser factor, the better. Otherwise, the model would be overfit, and that's not correct. But three, it's a good number. So the results were very promising. And very promising res result, actually even better, were obtained with uh, white bark pine. So in this case, we saw that the current year needle were the best predictor. And even though we had less plants uh, in our model, and just because in the park, less plants were available and in a reachable uh, position, we had a very nice separation of the group. And we have more plants belonging to the quadrants of uniquely uh, assigned to one unique um, phenotype and, and less plants in the overlapping, which means that the model was able to even better uh, discriminate between the two class. And in the partial least squared regression model, so our correlation plot, we have again a very nice correlation of the two groups of the uh, measured and um, predicted, uh, in this case, is the uh, stent symptom percentage. And again, this was obtained with only three factors. So these results um, were particularly surprising for me, especially for white bark pine. Because if you remember when I told you how I sample my plants, uh, Porter for cedar were uh, greenhouse plants. So they were, those were potted plants in a very homogeneous environment. But white bark pine was sampled in a natural environment. Those were natural plants, different age, different health condition, different growing environment, so a huge variability. And despite all this variability, it was enough for me to go there and sample a couple uh, of needles to be able to predict if that plant was going to be resistant or susceptible, and to predict the percentage uh, of symptoms in the progenies of those plants. So that's a very good uh, potential of this technique. So in conclusion, we were able to show that FTAR can be used in different pathosystems as well. So we already used it on oak successfully, now it works on two different conifers. This is a good uh, evidence that can be broadly uh, applied. Moreover, we were able to um, 
identify the most suitable tissue for any future analysis, at least in those two pathosystems. But the work is not finished yet. There are other steps. So, first of all, I can still improve the algorithms. The more sample I will add to my algorithms, the better they will look. But the most important step is the validation of the models. So we, use, we build our models using plants of which we know the phenotype and we insert that data to build the, uh, the algorithm itself. But uh, we will have to use our models on plants of which we know the phenotype, of course, but we're not gonna insert that data in the model because we wanna see if our model is actually able to correct classify uh, those plants. And if this is the case, once we have validated our model, we can go out there in the forest and sample any random plant of this path system and be able to predict the phenotype of this plant. Moreover, I ran all my sample on a benchtop instrument because that's what I had available at that time, but there are there handheld devices. So this little red guy over here, it's a portable FDR. It's already in commerce. It's just uh, used normally for um, um, material engineering or pharmaceutical industries, but why not using it for forest pathology? So it would be enough to go there out in the field um, Take off a little plug, because we always want fresh tissue. We don't want any oxidized tissue for our analysis. Place the sensor directly in contact with the fresh tissue, and there in five minutes, real time, know if that plant is gonna be resistant or susceptible, or how the progeny of that plant is gonna behave. So that's a huge improvement. Let's say we still wanna send those plants to a greenhouse screening to have, I mean, a confirmation of what we are predicting with our model. But instead of sending their 100 plants of which 90% will probably be susceptible, so basically a huge waste of time and money. We're gonna send out 100 plants of which 90% will be resistant because we pre-screen them. So that's a huge improvement for screening uh, procedures. Or we know that that plant is gonna be resistant or potentially resistant. Well, we might wanna pr uh, protect it against other factors. If this plant is resistant uh, to um, rust, we might wanna protect it against bark beetles or fire or any other uh, adverse uh, effect. So it's good to have a tool that it's able so quickly to tell us the mm, potential future of that plant. And I use it on um, two conifers. I mean, I tested on those two species, but it can be used in so many other species because we already have a good idea that it's, uh, it has a wide range of application. So with this, I'm concluding. I would like to thank you all for your attention and thanks in particular to Crater Lake National Park and the Dorina Genetic Resource Center in Oregon and the Bonello Lab, in particular Anna Conrad, of course, who introduced me to the magic world of FTIR, the Rodriguez Saona Lab, who owns the FTIR instrument that we use, and of course, all the funding agency. And with this, I'll be glad to take any question, if there's time. That was an interesting presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, and I might have missed it, but how does, how does, so your prediction for mm -hmm. the parent mm -hmm. predict what happens in the progeny? Or do we not know that yet? So we build, we're building two different models. The Simca model looks at the phenotype. We predict the phenotype of the parent trees. While the partial least squared aggression, in this case, we use it to predict the mortality rates or the percentage oh, of right symptoms on. in the progenies. It all depends on how you build your model. What data are you using? If to build your model, you use data regarding the parent trees, you're gonna predict data regarding the parent trees. Yeah. If you build your model with data that are uh, derived from the progenies, your model will predict the progenies. So it, whatever data you input as an input, that will be exactly, the same parameter will be your output. So it depends on how you build your model. And so then I guess the follow-up question to that is, if you were to, so basically you'd use that to screen what you could use for parents in breeding programs. Exactly, okay. that's it. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Katarina. And our last speaker of the session is Dr. Jason Smith. He obtained his PhD at the University of Minnesota, Minnesota in 2005 in plant pathology. And then in 2006, he joined the University of Florida at the School of Forest Resources and Conservation as the uh, a forest pathologist. And currently, he is an associate professor there. 
and he's also the lead pathologist for the Emerging Threats to Forest Research Group at University of Florida. And his title is um, Rapid Selection and Opportunities for Restoration of Laurel Wilt Tolerant Species. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Well, a lot of really uh, great talks so far. I mean, I'm amazed at the, uh, the resources and the tools that are being developed so quickly. And I think this is extremely important for trees. I think it was already mentioned that, you know, trees present a very unique uh, problem when, when, when we're trying to develop resistance and that they're very long lived. And most research projects end in one to two, maybe three years if you're lucky. And um, it's, it's often very difficult to be able to achieve our goals, you know, with, within the sort of the confines of our uh, current research infrastructure and our system, the way we do things. And so developing these tools rapidly, um, I think, is, are, are really going to allow us to move forward very, very quickly. Now, my talk is going to take a slightly different angle compared to the uh, previous talks. The previous talks have focused on systems that are well characterized and have a lot of resources, particularly on the host side. Um, and so one of the other sort of issues that we're dealing with with trees in particular is the introduction of exotic invasive pests and pathogens that are affecting you know, trees all of a sudden very rapidly. We're seeing you know, mortality events that are you know, threatening entire families of plants in the case with laurel wilt. And, and if, we don't, if, if we don't have resources in place to, to uh, you know, focus on host resistance, we have to kind of look at it a little bit differently and perhaps um, have slightly different um, approaches. But on the other hand, I think the, the development of these tools, like what we just heard about with FTIR and the genomic selection approaches, knowing how those work, uh, I think will allow us to be able to move more quickly with, um, with some of these, these emerging diseases as well with, with species that are less, less characterized. So I'll be talking about laurel wilt, which um, hopefully most of you have heard about at this point, but I'm not going to spend too much time. There's a lot of interesting biology and a lot of uh, interesting aspects of this, but this is basically a result of the symbiosis between a, an exotic ambrosia beetle from Asia, the red bay ambrosia beetle, Xylebris glabratus, and in one of its fungal symbionts, Raphaele lyricola, which is in the Ophiostoma tales and closely related to the, the famous Dutch elm disease pathogen, Ophiostoma novolmi. And so this is a interaction between com two completely clonal organisms that are um, basically wreaking havoc across the southeastern U.S. as they move uh, quickly. And this, this interaction occurs in the stems of the trees where the beetles uh, form their natal galleries and the larvae develop uh, basically by feeding on their, the fungal symbiont. And so in this case, this fungal symbiont uh, is causing a disease in the trees but typically, these beetles don't carry fungi that are known to be aggressive pathogens. Typically, they carry, you know, saprophytic organisms or, or weak pathogens. And so, this was a very sort of unprecedented event that an ambrosia beetle was carrying this aggressive, virulent pathogen that was capable of killing uh, almost entire uh, uh, species of trees and threatens an entire family on a continent. That was extremely unprecedented and, and not predicted. Um, and, and that's one, you know, one of the other issues that we're dealing with with forests is, is this, you know, these novel interactions between organisms that, you know, um, basically challenge our, our traditional paradigms about uh, invasion biology and, and, you know, basic, basic concepts of ecology of disease. And so that makes this particularly difficult. But the effect has been extraordinary. We've had, you know, incredible die-off. Uh, near elimination of a native, some of our native uh, perseas, red bay, swamp bay, silk bay. We have avocado, which is being threatened, and so the you know we have forests that have, have looked like this as a result. Basically, very similar to what uh, Dana talked about, just chestnut blight is we're, we're seeing that happen right now with with uh, our native perseas. And there's been a lot of other interesting things happening, and it wasn't just. The, the single vector at this point, we now know that this fungus is being moved around by other, or moved around into other ambrosia beetles, which could potentially lead to further expansion and, you know, further intensification of the epidemic. Uh, and there's all sorts of ecological questions and interesting evolutionary questions embedded in that, uh, that work that's being done by some of our, our entomology colleagues. But, you know, I, the story is really extraordinary. I mean, we, we've seen hundreds of millions of trees killed since 2002 in the southeastern U.S. Prior to 2002, laurel wilt was unknown. In fact, to this day, laurel wilt still has not really been 
identified as, as a, a factor in, in native Laraceae in Southeast Asia, and we have a recent report of it in avocado now in Asia. But um, it's the the impacts have been just astounding. It threatens avocado production, which is a you know huge uh, staple food crop in much of the uh, tropical uh, Americas. But also uh, there's a, yeah, ecological impacts as associated organisms like butterfly species that depend on the plants are being killed off. Those butterfly populations are declining. They are pollinators for other species of orchids. Uh, you have effects on the Everglades ecosystem, which is you know threatened by a lot of different things, a lot of invasive species. But now, one of the major components of the tree canopy and the tree islands in the Everglades is being killed by laurel wilt. So there's huge concern about that. There's cultural implications as um, tribal cu uh, culture here in Florida depends on these trees for uh, many different. Uh, medicinal remedies and also other cultural activities, and so there's there's uh, threats there. So it's a really um, just a, a really uh, devastating situation going on here, and it's been rapidly spreading. and And since it first was found in in um, Savannah, Georgia, it spread very rapidly throughout the southeastern coastal plain. Basically, the entire state of Florida is now uh, colonized, and has and the disease has moved through. And those of you that were on the field trip got to see the effects of this, and and that there's really not a lot of uh, of these per, per se is left in the forest. Uh, in this area, but it's also spreading further westward due, due to potentially due to anthropogenic movement, you know, and firewood and things like that. But there's a big concern about it getting into Mexico and also into California where avocado production is big and there's other, other Laraceae that we know to be susceptible. Um, Mark uh, has been, and others in my lab and, and other colleagues of ours elsewhere have been working on looking at the host range of this thing and it just continues to expand. Like I said, you know, this, there's the potential that the entire family is at risk in, in, this, in this part of the world. Uh, essentially all the native Laraceae that have been tested so far are showing uh, various degrees of susceptibility with many of them being very, very susceptible. But it includes um, the native Perseas, like I said, avocado, cultivated uh, Laraceae from, from Europe, like Persea indica, also from Asia, camphor is susceptible, sassafras, which extends all the way to Canada is susceptible, California bay laurel, which is an important hardwood species on the west coast, is highly susceptible as well. In addition to some critically endangered species like ponds, uh, pondberry and spice bush, and there, there's a poster about uh, pondberry if, if you want to look at that out there. But um, also we now know that the, the Mexican uh, analog to our red bay is highly susceptible. So there's a huge potential risk if this gets into Mexico that it would, it would wreak incredible devastation not only to the avocado production there, but also potentially the native forests, which are actually dominated by Laraceae in many parts of, parts of that, wor that part of the world. And Laraceae in general is an important family globally in forests. And there are, you know, is in, um, incredible diversity, met, you know, hundreds of genera, um, thousands and th you know many 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 different taxa that are found in many different parts of the world that we don't really un we don't really at this point know what the risk will be okay so we are interested in restoration um, looking at red bay and, th and that's what I'm going to talk about now so again we're when this first showed up in 2002 a lot of people didn't even know what red bay was so at that point it wasn't like we had a you know a genetic map of the species or any kind of resources it wasn't like you know a lot of really good botanists you know had barely knew what red bay was so so when it started dying off it was kind of like what is that thing over there that's dying off and everyone started paying attention to it at that point so that you know presents uh, some problems if you're trying to go out and you know develop resistant germplasm and so we had to take a slightly different approach but but there's several ways to look at it and you know when you're looking at restoration you can you can use you know clonal material you know if you have resistant individuals or tolerant individuals you can propagate those either through cuttings or tissue culture or something like that you can use seedling derived stock whether it be open pollinated or con through controlled crosses and we are actually taking approaches with both of these I'll talk about more in a second here but also with Red Bay, we, I will mention, I'm not going to be able to talk about it in this talk, but I wanted to at least mention it. 
that we think that restoration can happen u utilizing some other tools, not necessarily just by introducing new germplasm. One thing that we're looking at is coppice regeneration because the beetles aren't attracted to small diameter stems. So if we can keep the trees basically coppiced as sprouts, we can maintain that germplasm for the herbivores that utilize those plants, for example. So that's part of the, you know, the restoration process. Also potentially using fire to do that is another uh, key element that we're looking at. Also, Mark has been working on repellents, which we think we, could, we can protect individual trees potentially with those, and that's another interesting component. But, but we have really focused on looking for survivors, and this is the, the approach that we've taken. Mark, um, this is, much of this work was from Mark Hughes and from his PhD work, but basically he surveyed these areas where we had incredible levels of mortality, um, where virtually all of the trees were dying off and there was a high density of red bay. So he's going into these areas and looking for survivor, individual survivor trees after all the other trees had died off. And then um, he took cuttings from these trees, vegetatively propagated them. And then the, those vegetatively propagated trees were then tested for resistance and screening trials. So we, you know, we didn't have a FTIR approach at this point, but maybe we could go back and do that. But just by looking for these survivors, the, 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 the nice thing about this disease is it's so incredibly um, uniform in terms of the mortality and it's so virulent that if you find individuals that are survivors in these areas, you know, there's a high probability that there's a, there's a reason for that. It's not just random because there's, in, there's a very um, effective vector that's able to take, take the, the pathogen to the trees quickly. So we propagate the trees vegetatively and Mark figured out an entire method for doing that. Again, there was no information, even just on propagation of the plant. Nobody knew if we could even propagate them when we first started this work. So he figured out how to do that, generated over 150 clones from mother trees that were showing tolerance in the field, and then um, has then planted these out into field trials and then done artificial inoculations, multiple rounds of inoculations, as well as um, allowing them to get and naturally infected as well as one of the other things that we're, we're doing. Um, and, and one of the things we have to really understand is the mechanism of, of why these trees are wilting to understand resistance. And so once he identified these tolerant trees, he, we've started you know, collaborating with others and Randy um, Plutz and his group has also been looking at this in avocado and we've been working with some people in Minnesota. But basically we know that these trees are wilting and dying so quickly because there's a dysfunction in the xylem. The, the trees are basically reacting to the presence of the fungus by producing tyloses in the vessels and basically blocking the water movement. And there's very limit, limited fungal colonization as well, which has been recognized. But it's, it's, it's basically hypothesized that there's some sort of effector molecule or something produced by the fungus that is in eliciting this response in the host. And right now, the evidence is that with some of our tolerant material, including some of the avocado material that Randy's been looking at, there's a difference in those, in those vessels. Um, and and, and that, that's really what we're gonna be keying in on now more, um, is looking at that. But here's basically looking at the, the, the vessels, transverse sections, and you can see these blockages, the tyloses that form, and those basically effectively stop the, the water transport in the trees. So what we're hoping to do is, um, is to maintain this material you know, in these ex situ conservation plantings, to utilize other resources like the American Public Gardens Association, I'll talk more about that in just a second, to, to archive material, to use that for public engagement on the, on the, pro on the project, and to also serve as, as you know, potential future testing sites as well. But then we are also right now looking at uh, starting some uh, early sort of trial restoration uh, plantings in some of these areas where those trees were originally selected. So the idea is to go back to those places where all the trees were killed off except these mother trees and start putting these trees back. Um, now the American Public Gardens Association is really interested in this, uh, in this approach, not just with laurel wilt but with other, other um, threatened species. And so they basically um, are a group of you know, uh, public gardens all over the United States that have the ability to maintain germplasm, to keep that germplasm archived, to repropagate it, to, you know, distribute it to other, you know, other parties. And so this is a partnership with also with the U.S. Forest Service. And so we have a grant that um, has just started that we, where we will be starting to um, distribute these, these um, various tolerant clones to these different in, uh, institutions in the southeastern U.S. so that they can be archived and used in future work. But there's a lot of challenges to this. Um, I mean, obviously, 
we have a lot of questions. One of the big questions is the genetics of Red Bay. You know, very little is known about it. And so Kathy, who spoke earlier, has been working with, um, with uh, some folks with the Hardwood Genomics Project to basically do some genotyping with our, our Red Bay populations. We've got a lot of Red Bay material, more than just those clones now to work with. And so she's been testing microsatellite uh, markers in the population to try to uh, assess what you know what kind of genetic diversity there is is there um, a geographical component to that is there you know and that goes to the local adaptation question in terms of deployment uh, we have very limited knowledge of the life history and e ecology of the species and so simultaneous to all this stuff we're trying to understand you know how does red bait grow you know how does it regenerate what are the questions you know how how would we go back and restore these forests how would it be possible to plant um, we need to scale up germplasm that's a big thing you know if you're you, our cuttings take about eight months and we get you know if we're lucky 30 percent of them to root so um, we really need to try to scale that up and really um, beef that up. Um, and really also the other thing is about how do we do restoration when we have a rapid shift in forest species composition. When these trees die off, it's not like the forest is just stat is static and it stays that way, especially in Florida. You know, very rapidly either you have other native species that take over or more likely exotic species taking over, which presents a whole nother problem. So in the Everglades where, you know, these native perseas are being killed off, we have other invasive plant species coming in and taking advantage of that. So part of the restoration process will be to eliminate those invasive plant species and try to restore with the native um, red bay and related species that we're trying to restore. So we have some other future research questions. We want to know more about those mechanisms of tolerance. We have a grant pro that, that is focused on that. We want to look at the inheritance of tolerance. And we, we have colleagues that are doing this with avocado, and we are now doing this with red bay. We have seedling populations from those those uh, tolerant clones. So some of those 150 clones, we have seedling populations that are being grown in greenhouses, and we hope to be able to, to phenotype those. One of the questions we have is, can we phenotype them when they're smaller and, and have correlation with what we see with the bigger trees? A lot of the same questions that have been addressed with these other issues. Um, how do we implement long-term management and carry out restoration? Again, what is a potential host range expansion to other hosts? This is a big issue, and we're working with Randy Pletz on a SCRI grant to look at this by looking at other Loraceae from around the world to see, look at the patterns of susceptibility and tolerance and also be able to predict what's going to happen. And there's a lot of other questions that we're, we're addressing with some of our collaborators about you know, how the pathogen kills its hosts and um, what are some of the other Raphaelia killers that are out there. But anyway, there, it's a big research team. Like, uh, like I pointed out, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work on here. And again, Mark did a significant amount of this work, and, and this is, really should be his presentation. Um, but we, we do have funding um, from the USDA, from the Forest Service. If it weren't for the Forest Service, there'd be nobody interested in Red Bay. So we can't say enough uh, good things about the Southern Research Station and their support of this work because Red Bay not being an economically important species, it was very difficult to get the attention uh, you know, of any uh, regulatory agency really on that. It wasn't until it affected avocado that people started paying attention to this. And so that's one of the issues with these, these native plants species that don't have, you know, a, 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 you know, a discernible economic value. But anyway, thank you for your time, and if you have questions, um, feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. Thanks for coming to our session. Uh, thanks, Jason. That was very good. Uh, we have time for questions for Jason and Dr. Nelson, um, so feel free to um, ask questions. We'll be around if you have. Oh, there's one here coming up. Thank you. Yeah, so how widely spread now are these selections? Have you disseminated them to gardens or to natural sites where you're looking at how they perform and areas that have been de devastated by this disease? Are they well, that's, that's what we're, our goal is with the current grant, Randy, is that's, uh, and so we've been scaling up the, the, the material to do that. So right now they're just planted right around Gainesville, and we've got some... Um, you know, nurseries that we've got the plants in, but the, the goal with the, the current co-op agreement that we have with the Forest Service will be to do that. So we've, we've just started to engage the APGA, and um, the goal is to, is to get that material into the APGA collections and also to, to, to do some pilot restoration projects 
um, in the state parks where we originally uh, collected the material. Good question. Thank you for coming to our session. Yes, with that, I'd like to thank all the presenters. I know it's a lot of effort to travel out here, and um, thanks again. Very good talks.